So we didn't really have an honest conversation until probably the 15 year mark. Yeah. But we did have that frustrating core pattern of um, his chasing me and me avoiding him. And of course, the more he chased, the more I avoided. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. John, every time we have Mylon and Kay here, uh, our audience responds. You, you folks love to hear what these people have to say. And it's so insightful about our childhoods, what we learn, what we bring into relationships, whether that's your marriage, your parenting relationship, all of those things. Uh, it has an impact on us. And it, the better and more knowledgeable we are about that impact, the healthier your relationships are going to be. Uh, here at Focus, we want to see you thrive in your marriage and in other relationships. That's why we do this. Um, it's to equip you to have a full life in Christ. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the program. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Hey, you spent uh, the first 10 years of your marriage feeling stuck and unhappy. Take us back to that first 10 years so the folks that are struggling can better identify that they are in a place where they need help. Mm -hmm. What does it look like, your first 10 years of marriage? Well, the first 10 years of marriage, <laughs> we were simply operating on the downloads and operating systems that our families had imparted or downloaded into us without our, without our uh, permission, without our you know, participation, those early influences of how I view myself, how I view another person, what we means, whether we is necessary or whether I'm good on my own and I don't mm. need other. All those definitions were, were put in deeply into our lives early on. So when we first got married, we had early imprints where I was very worried that, the, that whoever other was, turned out to be K, <laughs> would not be attentive enough or would uh, be distant or disconnected. And then I would over-pursue her uh, to trying to get her attention. Little did I know she was an introvert and an emotionally avoidant person, and I would overwhelm her. And it would want to, you'll, you'd probably pull away at some level. That's right. I think what's true is those downloading systems are unconscious. Mm -hmm. Right. We're so used to them from our own family that to us, they're just normal. It's the normal way we behave. So in marriage, we aren't really anticipating that those histories are going to collide. And, you know, in dating, they don't often really, they're not that pronounced because our, our best foot is forward and we're all excited right. about having Isn't a new, this exciting relationship. And, you know, but you're married a few years and you start to really operate on those systems that were downloaded. And, you know, in my family, um, it was, you're on your own and figure it out. Yeah. From and an early from age. From an early age. And, right. you know, I don't really want to know what you feel and I don't, I'm not going to ask what you think or, so I was used to being on my own and someone pursuing me and wanting to be connected all the time was kind of like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's smothering I, you. I, I don't, yeah, you're too needy. <laughs> And so we think of that more mm. as a male, female, and just the, rever re the reverse. But yeah, we were the reverse of the male, female correct. stereotype. Yeah, and, and a lot of people that. are. The structure that you've applied to this, uh, how we love, is such a great analogy. You talk about five love styles. Let's touch on those briefly, kind of give us the description of those five, and then we'll begin to dig into the combinations. Sure. Let's start off and simply say that Kay and I were not secure connectors. We were insecure connectors. Had we been secure, we would have had less of a conflict between us, less of a core pattern. But I was the pleaser. And as a pleaser, I was very much the codependent, caretaking, rescuing kind of a person that was very focused on the other person, hypervigilant to see if you were okay. Because if you were okay, then I'd be okay. So I was dependent upon the other person. So the pleaser is a pursuer, and they're hypervigilant. Now, you were the avoider, and the avoider is just the opposite of that. Right. The avoider comes from a family where there's not an emotional connection with parents. No one's asking me growing up, how do I feel? Uh, if something difficult came along, I was on my own to comfort myself or to try and work my way through that. And so when the avoider gets married, they feel independent. They feel like they've made their own decisions for many years. So it doesn't even occur to me to consult him when I have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. And 
And oh. it translates to being strong. It's it, a valuable, it, oh, culturally yes. lifted up attribute. It, it is. I am strong enough to stand on my own. <laughs> yes, I, I have to say that um, it was difficult for me in my growth process to feel needy uh, because that was something that I just skipped over. You know, of course, every baby is needy, but I, I don't remember ever feeling needy in my family um, in those years that you really start to remember your, your history. So... The avoider is emotionally detached and distant, not because they're cold, but because they don't have the lessons growing up to learn how to articulate what's inside them, how to describe what's inside them, and then to tell someone else. Mm. That was foreign to me. So we have the avoider and the pleaser. Mm -hmm. and vacillator. The yes. vacillator is sort of a blend between those two. The vacillator is a pursuer also, but they have a history where there's abandonment or where they've lost connection from people that were vital to them. And it created a sense of fear or apprehension. And so their quest as they enter into life is to find someone ideally who would never disconnect from them. And so they pursue and when they, when they date, they find someone that is very much attentive and the dating relationship is alive and dyma dynamic and exciting. And yet after they get married though, that excitement begins to wane a bit and they start to get frightened and they start to get scared and then they get angry. Mm. Unlike the pleaser who would pursue fearfully or try to make you happy, the vacillator gets angry because they don't want to feel that feeling of insecurity mm -hmm. again. And so they pursue the other person in an angry way, which pushes the other person away even further. And it, it, it disables the very thing they want, which is connection. Okay. For the vacillator, they, they have an idealistic view of life. Um, they deal with the pain of childhood by idealizing the future. So when I get married, I'm going to find the perfect person oh, for wow. me. Oh, wow. So their expectations are Their sky expectations high. are very high, and they <laughs> don't really realize that. Yeah. So they're easily disappointed, and that disappointment is what fuels the anger. And so they're protesters. What they don't see is that their spouse is just giving, the, even when they have to wait, let's say um, I'm a vacillator female and my husband goes to work. Well, now I have to wait. I have to wait for him. I'm thinking when he's gone. Is he thinking about me? Is he excited to come home? So they're preoccupied a lot with, are we close? Are we distant? So if he comes home a half hour late, the conversation is, I can't believe that you are late. Right. I just cooked this nice dinner. Why didn't you call me? And he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, exactly. I got called into a meeting. Oh, I didn't, right. You know, it, it doesn't have to be based right. in any kind of suspicious behavior. No, no. Their, their abandonment theme is very easily triggered. Mm -hmm. And so they're quick to feel like they're unimportant, unseen, or they don't matter. But that really, that's a childhood wound yeah. that's coming out at the person in the present. And they don't see how their overreactivity is fueled from a childhood wound. Mm -hmm. What Now, let's cover the chaotic. Yeah. And we'll get to the better, healthier place, but uh, okay. chaotic then is... Chaotic uh, are just folks that come from a family that's uh, where instead of nurturing connection, there's actually some trauma or in, uh, there, it's a place where there's fear. What does that describe, that trauma, just so, again, the listener can understand, is it alcoholic home? It, it could uh, be um, very overt trauma, like violence or sexual abuse. It could be neglect. It could be a mentally ill parent. Um, it, it's a situation in which the child needs that parent for survival, but there's an element of danger, whether that danger is mild, medium, or severe. And so there's, there's always trauma in the history of these, these, Interesting. these yeah. folks. And the church is full of people from chaotic homes because God loves them and he goes after Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And salvation is there. And I'm gonna, we're going to get to that in a minute after right. we cover the areas because I want that biblical perspective on these observations. Mm -hmm. That's right. But so you kind of have two categories in this kind of home. The feisty kids grow up and they fight the system and they get angry and they become the controllers. And a controller is just a person who has to have control so they don't ever feel those terrible childhood feelings again. Interesting. Um, I don't want to feel humiliated. I don't want to feel ashamed. I don't want to feel afraid. So if I have control of my world, I don't ever have to go back to those feelings. Now, that's more of an unconscious vow than it is really. It's I don't think they're aware of why they need so much control. 
the more compliant kid survives at home by becoming um, just complacent. They, they hide in the closet, um, and they learn to tolerate the intolerable. They're more they like, find a coping mechanism. They don't protest. Right. And if they cope by just trying to stay under the radar, and in severe cases, they'll cope by dissociating, which means they sort of go off in their head, and they can be in the room without really being present. Yeah, em- emotionally. And yes. Yeah. And so these gal- uh, gals or these men often become more the victims. Right. And so they just don't have a voice. They've never had the ability to really feel any self-worth or learn to stand up for themselves. Mm. Okay, so Mylon and Kay, we've covered uh, four of the five. Let me just recap them. Avoider, pleaser, vacillator, and then that chaotic that we just covered. And then there's probably the what I would see is the healthier that you've identified, the secure connector. I like that. It communicates so much in those three words, the secure mm-hmm. connector. Describe that, and then we'll move ahead. The secure connector is our goal where we're all growing. Any one of these attachment styles, they're very unaware of the animating forces on the inside. We don't aren't aware until we become aware because all of a sudden we run into, as you were alluding to earlier, a problem that's a repetitive problem over and over again. I have to stop and look at myself. Lord, show me what's going on inside me. Mm. When we do, we can move toward this secure connector. What does that person look like? That person is an individual who has a strong sense of self that I am worthy of somebody listening to me, loving me, I'm love. I'm worthy of love and care, that if I speak, somebody will pay attention to me. They then know that the other person will be attentive and that they can often go to that person for help. They're not afraid to ask for help. And they find out as a secure person that the two of us together, we will be stronger than me alone. And there's a freedom and a lack of fear, a lack of anger and a security to be able to ask for what it is they want from the other person, Mm -hmm. to have strong ability to describe one's inner emotions like Christ did the night before he died on the cross where he said, my soul is distressed to the point of death. Come watch and pray with me. So as we look at he and his disciples, he wasn't alone in his distress. He grabbed his closest Peter, James, and John, shared what was going on in his soul. He had vertical support with the Heavenly Father in prayer. He had horizontal support with his friends. And he was able to get through that very desperate moment. Mm. And that's beautifully said. When you look at this, I want to make sure the person is saying, you know, this sounds a little psycho babblish. I just want to confront that because so often we in the Christian community struggle to say science will uncover God. I mean, this is God. Uh, He's in it. Yes. The 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 sins of your father being visited down to next generations. Mm -hmm. That is ancient language to describe what we're talking about in modernity, that when you come from families of origin that are dysfunctional, this is what you learn. Right. And that's what the scripture is actually talking about. It's just about. sin playing out. Right. And, you know, attachment researchers, um, this is a 70-year-old field of research, and yes, all they've done is describe patterns of sin. Right. 70-year-old history of 5,000 years of human relationship. That's right. That's and right. they, they, I mean, they just observe patterns. Yeah. And so this isn't just Mylan and Kay's opinion. This is based on scientific research. However, I, you know, many of them aren't believers, and they don't know that they're really just helping us understand where we're broken. Yeah. Where does Christ need to, need to redeem us? Because yeah. Christ wasn't an avoider. He was emotionally connected. He wasn't a pleaser. He could say no. Right. He could make people angry. He wasn't so idealistic. He said, the world is so broken, I need to die for it. Right. He, he wasn't a chaotic controller or victim. So really, when you look at these love styles, they all for, fall short of Christ. And we could even think of Christ as a secure connector, you know, in terms of uh, that's not a biblical term. But when you look at the traits of a secure connector, they're certainly descriptors of Christ. And I think the goal of understanding this material is to become sanctified yeah, and, and to it, grow because it's freedom. Let's move in the last few minutes here because I want to talk about the combinations, which is uh, really what you delve into and in how we love because in order to love, you have to have another person involved. Right. So you, you now you're bringing all these combinations into play and that creates yet new orbits of chaos. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so why don't you guys well put. take it there, just talk about those combinations and what couples need to do to first identify who they are 
and then identify their spouses and say, okay, here's, here's why we're having this conflict. But give the combinations. Okay, so if you take our combination, Casey avoider, I was the pleaser. Now she's no longer an avoider, I'm no longer a pleaser. We've grown more into that secure connector, by the way. So the point there is you can change. We can oh, change, absolutely. that's awesome. We are no longer those people that 15, that 30 years ago, right. at the 15 year mark of our marriage, that we were then, we are very different people. Right. But what our marriage looked like then was, Kay, are you all right? Is everything okay? I, I'm fine. Why do you keep asking well, me that? Well, because you haven't looked at me and smiled all day. Are you okay? Y yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I, I didn't know I wasn't looking at you. It's making me cringe but, uh, listening I'm, I'm to I'm good. You. Are, I think you're, I, I upset you somehow. Are you sure no. there isn't something I did? No. I. And you're not upset about something? I don't, no, I'm fine. I keep telling you, I'm fine. Well, I can hear by the impatience in your voice well, right now. Well, I'm getting impatient that, because well, you see, keep asking me if something's wrong. wrong. But there is something wrong. See, I can yeah, tell Yeah, what's it. wrong is that you keep asking me what's wrong. <laughs> I want to go run in the closet. Yeah, we're making, <laughs> I know who I am. <laughs> we're making some people really uncomfortable right here. I'm, I'm, already, I'm like, my skin is crawling <laughs> listening to this. Well, but of course it would. Yeah. See, because that maybe if your skin really was tra uh, crawling, it triggered you somehow because, <laughs> right. because you heard conflict. Right. But that was a repeatable pattern right there between over the two of us. Over and over. And, you know, the thing, we call these dynamics a core pattern. Mm -hmm. And a core pattern is simply a descriptor of how your histories collide. Now, for the avoider and pleaser, that's about as conflictual as it got. Right. Um, neither of these like conflict. So avoiders don't like it because it's messy and emotional. Pleasers don't like it because you might get mad at me. So we didn't really have an honest conversation until probably the 15-year mark. Mm, yeah. But we did have that frustrating core pattern of um, his chasing me and me avoiding him. And, of course, the more he chased, the more I avoided. And when we begin to understand attachment, we begin to understand this was the root yeah. of mm -hmm. this core pattern. My lack of bonding in my home and my avoider tendencies and his fearful home and his pleaser tendencies, that was the root. And so we begin to work at the root in changing. So that was our core pattern. Mm -hmm. How about that vacillator avoider? That's probably the most common core pattern we see walk into therapy because neither one of us wanted to go to therapy. But the vacillator is the protester and they want ideal. So what are they going to do? We need help. We're going to therapy. Now, vacillators are attracted to avoiders because avoiders are consistent, they're predictable, but when they marry and they're with them a while, they're like, hello, are you there? Hmm. <laughs> so, so let's role play that. Hey, hi, how are you? Hey, where's the mail? Uh, it's right here, honey, where it always is. Okay, so I'm looking for something here that I was expecting today. Where, I, where you know is what? it? Did you, you move the mail by any chance? Because it's not here. It's here every day. I know, but, but you know what? I have something super fun to tell you and super exciting to show you. So come here. You, you can look you know in a what? minute. You know what? Sometimes you throw the mail away. You think it's I don't it's even want to talk about the mail. And, and I've seen you do I, that. On, I remember I've been when you threw bit. payroll away once. And this is really important. You know what? Okay. It says bank on it. Now, do you know where that is? I'm looking for it. I have oh, to. Wait, 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 wait. You know what? This is not today. Every day. Oh, hello, Mail. Hi. Oh, no. oh I'm, uh, you know, oh, you know, Jim, Mail, I'm concerned. how are you? I'm concerned what that we just talked. What do you have talked. to show me? We oh. just told everybody else that was still listening to turn off the radio because of the conflict we're listening to right no. now. Wow. You love the mail more than me. I'm going to the gym. It's good. Oh. See you later. <laughs> Oh. I'm, hey, minute. Gene, I did not mention this to my <laughs> and Kay. I didn't mention the mail thing at all. Oh, my goodness. So uh, I'm the avoider. You see, I'm task mastery oriented. Yes. I have something I want to get to. It's time sensitive. I was supposed to receive it in the mail. Uh, That's all I, he's thinking about. I, I'm just thinking I want to get that done. I'll see you a little later, but, you know. All but, I'm thinking about is, did he think about me today? I can't wait to show him this. Oh, my goodness, I'm so excited to see him. Why yeah. do I not learn that he always goes to the mail first? I've told him over and over, but he doesn't listen. When we dated, <laughs> when we dated, it was this, you know, it was right. the pure eye to eye. But now that life has set in these early attachment experiences that we're not even aware are imprinted into us take over. They begin to drive mm -hmm. the bus. So that would be two of the most common core patterns we see in our offices. And lastly, that vacillator pleaser. Let's not, even if it's less common, let's mention those folks. 
Well, let's role play that really quickly. Um, I'll be the vacillator, you be the pleaser. Okay, that okay? sounds great. I walk through the door. Hey, I'm home. How you doing? Oh, hi. You know what? Yeah, I know. That's I'm on the phone. I got to. I'm on the phone. Okay. Well, you're always on the phone when I come home. <laughs> I, I gotta go. I know. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I, I get it. I'm home. I, I'll be right there. Okay. Yeah, I know that's rough, but I really have to go. <laughs> All right. I'm home. All right. Uh, okay. I, I really have to go. All right. Bye. Hi. Hi, honey. How are you? You always have this empathy for everybody else. But and you always see everybody else so closely. You see other people. Oh, honey, but it was just Susie. You I know, walk through the door through the and divorce. it's blanco. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, like you don't I love even. You. you know, I you tell me that, but your body and your behavior doesn't tell me that. It's I, like I, I didn't matter you know, when I walked through the today. door. I just didn't know you were going to come. It didn't home. matter when I walked through the door. I remember when we were dating. You would just light up. Honey, I love you so much. How about I make your favorite dinner? You're just. Do you know that is so... We dis- could go out to dinner. You're just trying to appease me now, and that just irritates me. Well, honey, but don't be mad. So there. <laughs> yeah. So there. Now, I'm thinking, how can you be a vacillator, pleaser, avoider, all in the same person? <laughs> well, I just switched roles. No, but, I don't know. I'm the, joking about me. I'm just seeing so much of oh. okay, well, you things know, like this I, in our relationship. I, I'm going to answer that, because you just brought up a very good point. For what we were just role playing, the vacillator's still protesting. The pleaser just tries very hard to please and make them happy. But you know, we have people all the time say, "But I'm all of them," and my next question is always, "Well, did you have a difficult childhood?" And they always say, "Yes." Hmm. So in my home, it worked to be an avoider. It, it brought peace if no one showed feelings. In a chaotic home, nothing works. You can try pleasing; doesn't change a thing. You can hope for something; doesn't doesn't happen. You can be the avoider. It's still, there's still chaos. Hmm. So, you know, we just tell the people from difficult homes, just start with the thing you think you do the most. And it might not be the controller victim. It might be that you're more the vacillator or more the avoider at this point in your life. So, you know, I think if you're not sure, you can always go online and take the test. And yeah, which would be good of, to yeah. do. Uh, Mylon and Kay, I am so mindful. We are out of time, and we have, like, ripped this Band-Aid off of a wound where we're talking about styles and behavioral issues. We've got to end with the God thing, which is where do we go when we know our heart a little better now and we know that we're not living in a place that's as healthy as it should be. What are some of the key things we can do? You talk about soul words, for mm-hmm. example. And folks, get the book. That's the bottom line. I mean, this is something you should invest in <clears throat> so that you can have a healthier marriage. And it can be fun, but it'll also be hard. But uh, we're not going to be able to cover it all here today. But let's end on that high note of soul words, what God intends here. How do we begin to restore There's four steps. Become aware. Tell someone else what you're aware of. The other person listens and then asks, what do I need? So I had to become aware, self-aware, and tell Kay, Kay, I realize that, and this was an answer to prayer to that Psalm 139. I pursue you and you make me anxious when you look away because I'm a fear-based person. Mm -hmm. And when I could confess that to you, Mm -hmm. you your whole attitude toward me changed, and, and it, it absolutely was a transforming, uh, a, a transformative moment. And then I had to, Ephesians 4, speak the truth to her and tell her what I was really feeling. Uh-huh. She listened to that, and then you asked me questions. I learned is, to listen. I wasn't a very good listener No, first. neither of us were, but then you explained James 1, where we are supposed to be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow right. to anger. Mm. Yes, I, those are all biblically driven mandates. Yeah, I think you know the hope is, is we don't just talk about the problem in our book. The whole workbook has been re- revised as well, Good. and there's more than these three core patterns. There's actually nine core patterns yeah. that we have in the book, and so the workbook will take each of those styles through a growth process. But in the end, what we didn't realize is that there's freedom. Mm-hmm. I, had, I didn't understand that uh, being a voider was like being in a prison. And as mm. I began to grow out of that, I, God gave me back my feelings. He gave me back the ability to ask for comfort and to feel comfort. And so I, I can't encourage people enough. It's, it's maybe hard to hear a diagnosis, but with a diagnosis, change is possible. Well, in, in one of the ways of seeing that, you know, human beings, we are creatures of habit. We fall into ruts. Right. And what you're saying in a different v- vocabulary is, 
here's the payoff. Oh, this is the payoff why is it's worth it to go through the pain of recognition, the four steps you just mentioned. Uh, yeah, describe the payoff. What does it look like today for the two of you? That's right. And you have to pick your pain, the pain of staying stuck or the pain of growing. And the, be the benefit and the payoff for us today is this is my best friend. We know how to have conversations that are hard uh, unparalleled deep. anywhere else. We're vulnerable, we're transparent, and we trust each other. It's like trapeze artists. We can let go and know the other person's going to catch me. That's a beautiful word picture. Yeah. You know, at the very end, I'm mindful of the fact that one of the two have heard this program, and they're captivated, hopefully, by it. And they're saying, yeah, I'm going to go home and talk to my husband about this. And there's not a great response. What does that spouse who is motivated to look deeper uh, do with the, the spouse that isn't? Start with yourself. Uh, it's always good advice. <laughs> you know, if, if you can even give your spouse the book and say, I just realized I'm a pleaser. And will you read this and see if you think that that describes me? Because oh, I okay. think it does. So let them be the doctor. You know, I'm really good. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm really going to work on this. This is really important to me. And, you know, so thank you for helping me with that. You've, you've implanted a, um, a seed of curiosity. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, I, I'm going to change and grow. And especially if you think your spouse will be resistant, that's a great approach. Yeah, that is a good point. Thanks for being with us. Always so good. We're glad to be here. Lovely to be with you. We love being here. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there. And be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.